Norman is our uh, CEO of YWCA McLean County, and we're also joined by Tiffany Grant, who is um, the board chair for YWCA McLean County. And just while we're waiting, maybe the two of you could say a few things about this partnership or uh, any other things that YWCA is doing that the community might want to know about. Sure. Not to put you on the spot. <laughs> no, that's okay. Thank you everybody for joining us. Um, maybe there's some technical difficulties. I know I had trouble logging in at first, so hopefully Jeff will join us soon. Um, this is one of three sessions that we're doing focused on uh, Black history in McLean County. We're excited to partner with Jeff and his team. Um, we've had some other events throughout the month and we do have a couple trainings um, that are loaded on the website. At the beginning of the month, we did a session on exploring Black History Month. And so if you're interested in that, we can drop the link in the chat. Uh, you can watch that recording. Um, and then we have some, some upcoming opportunities that we'll make sure are on our Facebook page. Um, Tiffany, did you wanna share anything? You know what, actually, I, I, everything is going well. So hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, we truly, truly appreciate you joining um, the series um, for our local history here in Bloomington Normal in McLean County. Um, this was really something um, near and dear to me, and I hope that you guys truly enjoy it. Uh, Jeff Woodard is a very outstanding uh, presenter and had lots of great information. I hope you guys can pass the test at the end. Just kidding. <laughs> just kidding hopefully you will enjoy having um a little bit of dialogue with us on some historical facts um i'm looking forward to uh, getting all the information i know because not all of us are from bloomington normal i myself am from decatur illinois so um i have macon county history that i know but mclean county history the largest county here in illinois i'm looking forward to know, knowing more about what McLean County has to offer as far as even to um, this very day. We, we're still making history. Congratulations to Carla Barnes for her um, um, judicial ships that she's just received. I hope that's a word. Um, as a judge here in McLean County, she just created a, a new space for um, women of color as well um, to become judges here in McLean County. So her being the first to be there, that is amazing. So thank you again. I hope you enjoy the series. Please join us again for the next two days here at two, about two o'clock, 2.15. We'll be doing this again. And hopefully we can make this a yearly, our annual thing where we can learn more and more about McLean history, McLean County history, I should say. Thank you. Thank you so much, Liz and Tiffany, um, Jeff has joined us, so I'm going to go right in and introduce Jeff. Jeff Woodard, he is the Director of Marketing and Community Relations for the McLean County Museum of History. Jeff has been with the museum in his current capacity for 15 years. Prior to joining the museum staff under the direction of Greg Coos, Jeff worked as a volunteer in the Stevenson Ives Research Library for five years. Jeff has worked with the Bloomington Normal Black History Project to reboot it in 2017. So I will go ahead and hand it over to Jeff. And Jeff, you just let me know. Um, he does have a couple poll questions for you guys. So we are going to be a little interactive. And he's just going to let me know when to put that up. And we'll go ahead and get started. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And uh, I apologize for my technical difficulty. I was actually on another call and couldn't get off. And But um, I'm here. Thank you very much. Um, I'm excited. This opportunity is really um, for me to have a, hopefully have a conversation. Um, I'm not a historian. So um, I would just like to give a really brief glance into local history and in, in a, an attempt to possibly have some uh, really meaningful discussion and we'll have uh, a choices activity at the end and um, we'll have some scenarios and basically we'll just ask you what would you do. A little bit about the Black History Project. Uh, before the Bloomington Normal Black History Project was organized, little history had been recorded on African Americans in McLean County. 
in the 1930s, Wyatt Wells was commissioned, run me right out of high school by the Works Progress Administration, the WPA, to write a history of blacks in the area. In the early 1950s, Carabel Washington participated in the effort, writing essays on black churches and their choirs. In the 1960s, a group that included Howard and Elaine Bell and Joe Monroe and several others formed to collect local history as well. In the 1980s, Mildred Pratt began sending her ISU social work students out to tape interviews with elderly members of the Black community. And as I understand it, originally uh, these students were to go out and document um, medicinal practices, uh, home remedies, which I thought was interesting. And um, they found that the interviews were so rich that they just uh, continued to do them. A few years later, the Bloomington Normal Black History Project was launched. Organizers and participants included Dr. Pratt, Carabel Washington, Stephanie Shaw, Reggie Whitaker, the Bells, Wilbur Barton, Lucinda Posey, and then Executive Director Greg Coops for the McLean County Museum of History. Over the years, the project members and friends have continued to donate materials that span the 19th and 20th century. Due to these efforts, the Bloomington Normal Black History Project today and the McLean County Museum of History now have an outstanding collection of African-American artifacts, primary resources, and oral histories, and we continue to collect those. These materials form the basis for the exhibit, Presence, Pride, and Passion, and the book of the same title. Today, the exhibit challenges, choices, and change explores the experience of living, working, farming in McLean County, and now it includes the rich stories of African Americans. So we're pretty excited about that. So let's meet our guy, Dr. Eugene Covington. If we can have that slide up. Okay. Here we go. So we talk about the presence of uh, African-Americans in McLean County. Um, Blacks chose to make McLean County their home, of course, as early as the 1830s through tragedy and hardship. Uh, some became homeowners and lived in many areas of the city. There was really no specific area of the city of, uh, or the area of um, McLean County where it was just designated for Blacks to live because of their, um, their work. Uh, took them all over the, uh, the county. So, and they were, some people even worked in the homes of other people um, that they worked for. So they were uh, pretty much scattered out throughout the community. Uh, and that one such individual was Dr. Eugene Covington. Dr. Covington was uh, the only black medical professional to successfully practice in McLean County into the late 20th century. So. Okay. Eugene Covington was born in Rappahannock County, Virginia, in the mountains there in uh, August of 1872. His parents were Joseph and Elizabeth Holmes Covington. Both parents were born into slavery. So I can imagine how uh, concerned they were for uh, their only son to get a good education. So uh, mandatory public education in 1870 created 14 white schools and 17 black schools in the county. Eugene's high test scores led the principal of the segregated elementary school to suggest enrolling him in a local Catholic school. Now, although the Covingtons were not Catholic, he attended the school and of course, um, continue to excel. 
Dr. Covington graduated in 1895 and went on to study medicine at Howard University. And I think his story speaks to the power of historically black colleges and universities, HBCUs, and the black experience. In a 1992 interview, his son, Eugene Covington Jr., stated that his father also went on to earn a degree in gynecology and obstetrics from Northwestern University. Covington supported himself by working summers at a restaurant in Adirondack Mountains, waiting tables, and it was there where he first met his uh, future wife, Alice Elena Lewis of Oswego, New York. They were married in 1902 and had three children, Gerard, Eugene Jr., and Joseph. Dr. Covington had moved to Bloomington sometime between 1900 and 1901. His office was located at 313 and a half North Main Street in downtown Bloomington. If you want to put that slide up, I think most of you know what that is. It's an art gallery now. Now, for some reason, I'm not sure why he moved to uh, the new location next to his house at 410 East Market Street. Maybe he needed to be closer to his family. Um, it's not known whether he had a nurse or a receptionist, but he would also make house calls to patients unable to visit his office. Mrs. Carabelle Washington was one of his patients. And as I also understand that uh, Dr. Covington may have even delivered Carabelle. So Carabelle remembers how Covington always arrived at house calls in a car driven by his son, Gerard. Although Covington owned a car, he never drove one himself uh, for some reason. Mrs. Washington remembers him as being well-dressed and known for being classy, well-spoken, and occasionally thought of as being pompous by some. Uh, quite a character. When he stepped into a room, you knew he was somebody. Carabell says you knew he was Dr. Covington. Covington was voted into the McLean County Medical Society in 1901 and remained a member until 1910. At one point, he was suspended for non-payment of dues. Although Covington was a successful doctor, you know, he often fell on hardships. Other doctors undercharged black patients who were otherwise able to pay. And of course, he was dependent on those black patients for his living. It has been said that when he was beginning to establish his practice in Bloomington, he used to rush his buggy in and out of the yard to give the appearance of having lots of business. It's kind of like the wild, wild west. I could have just imagined you know, competing for business in, in the early 1900s and he'd be the only African-American, of course. But in the African-American community, when people moved to town, everyone let newcomers know that he was the good doctor in town. So he had quite a bit of practice. Besides owning his own practice, Covington was a member of the St. Joseph's Hospital staff and had full privileges at the Mennonite Hospital, which is now, of course, Advocate Broman. Covington faced certain challenges due to his race. Sure he did. Despite being well-respected and a talented physician, he was not allowed to perform surgery without having a white doctor in the room to supervise. Racial tensions increased throughout Dr. Covington's life as we move into the course of the uh, 1920s and uh, this is a, a really dark period in history a rise of the Ku Klux Klan and such. As the population of black increased, so did the rise of Jim Crow. Unflattering images, to put it nicely, pervaded to newspapers along with blackface minstrel shows and, and that sort of thing. Covington was outspoken on issues of voting, education, and employment. He tried very hard throughout his life to fight against racism. And of course, he suffered for that. When in the 1915 silent movie, D.W. Griffin's uh, Birth of a Nation, 
uh, was released, Dr. Covington fought to keep it out of Bloomington theaters, citing his racist views of Blacks, but I'm not really sure if he was successful at that. Don't think he was. Dr. Covington also requested that the mayor of Bloomington hire a Black patrolman. The policeman was hired and fired, but Covington eventually persuaded the mayor to hire him back. Dr. Covington emphasized education as a way for young African Americans to have opportunities for success. And I imagine he used a lot of what he learned at Howard University and put forth um, his beliefs. At a Sunday school convention in 1903, Covington stated that he felt proud of the progress his people had made in the past 40 years and hoped that it would continue. He stated that if he would, could do all in his power, he would to help build up members of his race. At one point, he promised a young man that he would buy him a suit if he finished high school. Well, that young man received his suit and wore it proudly on graduation day. Dr. Covington ran for city council in 1915, but did not secure enough votes in the primary to continue to the general election. He also participated in organizing a Negro businessman society and was very active in the local NAACP. He attended Wayman AME Church and served as a board trustee. I find that really interesting because um, Carabelle Washington also served on the trustee board of Wayman AME Church. And uh, I had the opportunity to also serve on the uh, trustee board with Carabelle Washington. And we'll hear a lot about her um, on Thursday. Covington's wife was also active as well. She was with uh, active with the Progressive Club. And the main focus of the club was to take on civic and educational tasks. And I imagine they would have um, um, parties for kids, you know, Christmas parties and that kind of thing for the um, kids in the area. Once Alice attended a performance at the Majestic Theater and was so bothered by the segregation, afterwards she refused to use segregated facilities such as the Miller Park Beach. And uh, she just would not go after that. And uh, Mrs. Covington died in June of 1925. Three years later, Covington remarried to Amanda Thomas. They had no children together. After a short illness, Dr. Eugene Covington died at the Memorial, sorry, Mennonite Hospital. Uh, that would have been in uh, 1929. So he was uh, 56 when he died. In a newspaper memorial, the writer stated that Dr. Covington spent 29 years of his life in this vicinity for the sole purpose of administering relief and happiness through his knowledge gained and medicine to those concerned. Dr. Covington was uh, buried at Evergreen Cemetery and uh, he's been featured in the uh, cemetery walk. I feel like he was a, a, a tortured soul for sure. And you can uh, learn about um, Dr. Covington's exploits, uh, political exploits, especially uh, uh, on the WGLT Mech History series. And we could, um, we could put a, um, a link in the chat as well, I think. I think I'm able to do that. And um, you can learn about uh, more about Dr. Covington. So I didn't know if we wanted to go right into the choices activities or if there were some questions now, or we could almost also have some uh, time for questions afterwards. Question, I think question? that's completely up to you, Jeff, if you wanna start doing the choices and then take questions. Um, I'm, if anybody wants to put any questions in the chat, 
um, instead of uh, saying them out loud, maybe to avoid a little embarrassment if you don't like to talk on the on Zoom, <laughs> I'm happy to relay those questions to Jeff. Sure, I'd be happy to if I can. But I can go ahead and launch the first question if you'd like. Okay, first I'll say hey to Missy Thomas out there. I see um, she was in my MCLP class. So she's giving me a shout out. I'll give her a shout back. Uh, but uh, go ahead, sure. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry, I had a question. Okay. Um, Jeff, I believe uh, you were affiliated or used to be at Western Avenue Community Center in some I, capacity. I am. Okay, that's what I thought. I, I just, I saw you presenting and I just wanted to say thank you. I used to work there as well, so. Thank you so much. Thank yeah. you so much. Yes, I, I remember, yes. I am on the board at uh, Western Avenue Community Center. That, that's what I, that's what I, that's what I figured. Yeah, well, that's what we want to do. We want to chop it up and have a conversation, right? That's what the YWCA does. Anybody else? I have a question. Yes, ma'am. Um, you had made mention of his first wife. And I'm sorry, I was writing down all this information as you were talking. His first wife, do you know his her name? And, then, and did they have any children? And are they still living here in Bloomington? Are any of them still alive? Uh, I believe he has. Um, now we learned this through a um, Living Black in Bloomington WGLT uh, series that he has a great grandson possibly uh, living in the area. Um, but um, his wife was uh, Alice Elena and they did have three children. Gerard, Eugene, and Joseph. And uh, of course, they met up at the uh, Adirondack Mountains while he was waiting tables um, in a restaurant there, um, you know, um, earning money to pay for school and support itself. And uh, she was from Oswego, New York. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Another question in the chat from Don Wilcox, and he asks if there is any information as to why Dr. Covington came to Bloomington in the first place. We're not sure, not yet. So that's a good question. That's something that you can explore. We're really not sure why he came to Bloomington. Um, yeah, I'm just not sure. And um, um, another question that he has is, do we know whether Dr. Covington had any white patients? Absolutely, good question, good question. Dr. Covington had uh, both black and white patients. But you remember when it came to surgery, um, you know, he had his challenges because he was not allowed to perform any surgeries unless there was a, a white physician in, in the room. Good question. I, I have a question. Um, do you know if there has been any exploration of the archive at Broman and the archive at St. Joe to see if there's any additional pictures of them? Um, I don't have the answer to that, but um, I know I've done some extensive looking at um, Illinois Digital Archives and um, I have not been able to find anything. Um, I'm, I'm, we're hoping that there's something out there. That's a good question. And I'll, I'm going to pursue that because I wanted to have some more pictures of him if possible, for sure. Yeah, I'd imagine that, he, you know, he left... Um, Virginia, you know, in search of uh, opportunity. Um, There's from a small area there. Um, wasn't much opportunity, I'm sure, for him there. But why he exactly ended up in Bloomington, Omaha, I'm not sure. Yeah. Hey, Jeff, this is Linda. How you doing? Hi, Linda. I just have a question my grandson is asking me um, as well. Uh, did he participate in any organized activities uh, and which church did he go to? Oh, he was uh, active in Wayman AME Church. He served on the trustee board. I remember that because I found that to be very special because I'd served on the AME Church uh, trustee board myself with uh, Carabelle Washington. And I was like, what a coincidence. And he did. And uh, he was uh, also uh, instrumental in starting the Negro Businessmen Club. 
and he also was active in the NAACP. Yes. Thank you. We have we have uh, such a small information about him, and and so thank you for saying that. And we're going to keep digging and try to find out his role. Thank yes. you. Yes. And let me know what you come up with. Okay. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, that's the power of history, though, right? You know, uh, we're standing on the shoulders of those who came before us. And I always share a story that when I came here, I just felt like I really wasn't welcome here. And then I started learning all these stories of all these, these great African Americans who migrated to this county. And I was like, you know, I have just as much right to be here as anybody else. So we're going to continue to spread the gospel on that. So um, if we there's have a, any- there's We have one any... more question from the chat, Jeff from Barbara Torres. She asked, were his children activists too? Um, that I don't know. I don't, I, nothing's coming to me right now, but um, that'll be something to go back because you know we do have their names, uh, but I have not done research on that. That is a very good question. It's a very good question. Yep, keep asking those questions. Okay. For those that are doing their own research on this, and if you find, it, find any answers, we'd love for you to post them on Facebook and tag YWCA and the museum as well. So uh, we can have uh, all the answers for all of us to share. And then another question just came in from Beverly. Did yeah. he have any staff at his office? As far as I can tell, uh, he did not have a secretary or receptionist or nurse or anything of that, that nature um, in his practice, as far as we could tell. There's a lot of unknowns with him, but that's, you know, that's good, uh, good fodder for research, I think. Okay. Okay, if there's not any more questions, uh, you want to put up the first questions and the choices activity? There you go. Okay. We'll give I'll read it to you second. if you are on, we'll set the scenario for you. You are on the ISU's Board of Controls in 1897. So you want to think about yourself at that time, because I'm going to ask you, what would you do? And I would like to know, what would you do? Maybe not today, but what would you have done then, All right? So uh, you need to appoint a new coach for the baseball team. There are a couple of candidates. And one has a lot of experience. However, he is black. What would you do? Appoint a less experienced white coach appoint the experienced black coach or keep looking for a better qualified white coach? Everybody should be able to see this. Um, it should have popped up for you. And if you could just take a second and click your answer, that would be great. And Jeff, did you say to look at this as if we are living in you know, 1897, what we think would happen? Uh, yeah, what would you do? I mean, to put yourself in that, in that position. Would you step out and be bold or, I mean, you know, yeah, I'm just gonna put them out there and let you decide what maybe what you would do. Everybody's different, right? I know what we know today and we know what our positions are, but when you say 1897, you're saying a different time, a different mindset. Um, and, and you don't want to put people in arms way. You know what I mean? Okay. So we've seen what happened to Coach Carter. So I, I, I just, if I look at it, that if I was back in 1897 and I had a choice and I had a voice, which in most cases I wouldn't have no voice, 
and it's, it's kind of ironic to think that you know there would be a black coach that step out there like that. But hey, if we're looking at today, I'm going for it. All right. Did everybody get a chance to answer it? Has anybody clicked an answer yet? I'm showing that nobody's answered it yet. So um, if I'm not getting the information. You did answer? OK. Christy, I yeah. did too. This is Chris. OK. Yeah. Hey, hey, Liz, can you, are you uh, getting this poll that you can vote on it? or? Cause we're I, both I am seeing results. So oh, um, perfect. Great. Yeah. It, it could be that we're both kind of sharing a, yes. a Zoom account here. So yeah, it looks like results wise, it's saying a couple people voted for appointing a less experienced white coach, about 18 people voted to appoint the experienced black coach, and about seven people said keep looking for a better qualified white coach. So a lot of people are probably having a hard time thinking about that 1897 mind, mind frame. And, you know, obviously, we hope we would do the right thing, um, be on the right side of history. But you know, very different world in 1897 than in 2021. Okay, so hey, uh, hey Liz, I don't want to interrupt. I just wanted to let you guys, I'm on Zoom every day for class, for school. Um, only the main host, so if you guys are co-hosting, only like the main host who created it can see the results, if that makes any sense. <laughs> I'm not sure. The main host, okay. Thank you. Okay. All right. So, we ready for the question. What would you do? Um, I think the majority had it right. You would appoint the experienced black coach. And he did. 69%. Good job. Now I say that and um, respond to what Linda said about it was a different time. Um, in 1897, you see, we went ahead and uh, chose the black coach because in Bloomington Normal, things were pretty relatively um, calm. I'll use that word um, in the McLean County uh, for African-Americans. It was just shortly after that when things began to change, when we kind of slept, slipped into this whole uh, Nadir period that just probably started after Reconstruction. It went into the uh, 1920s, you know. At that point in the 1920s, I think the Ku Klux Klan had uh, 5 million members. That's just hard to get your head around. So, but um, yeah, good for McLean County. We got a black coach. Okay. You want to try another one? Um, yeah, I actually, um, Claire LaMonica just had a really great response in the, in the comments there. She said she knows about ISU's early days and the beliefs of its founders. And I just wanted to ask if you wouldn't mind, Claire, not to put you on the spot, but if you could tell us a little bit about that, I think that would be really interesting. Yes. Thank you. Well, um, sorry. Hold on. I'm more comfortable talking if you can see me. <laughs> there we are. Um, just that, you know, um, ISU was originally founded by uh, Abraham Lincoln and the people who were surrounding him. And they uh, got in, actually got into a lot of trouble uh, politically and publicity wise early on. Um, they were uh, really condemned by newspapers in the Chicago area who um, referred to their uh, willingness to allow participation by people of color in extremely derogatory and angry terms. Um, but they, you know, that, so when they were following their, I think early on when those people were still around their, you know, their, their those thoughts that mindset might have still been influencing um, some of their, actually um, the laboratory school at ISU broke off. It was originally associated with Bloomington Public Schools and it broke off um, 
or was chased off after its decision to admit um, an African-American child into the school. Um, so there was some, you know, certainly not a perfect history uh, throughout by any means, but at least early on, um, people were sort of acting on their, uh, the beliefs of the founders and um, which were also not perfect, but their hearts were in the right way. Also much later on, of course, there was a black basketball coach at the university who um, coached Doug Collins. He was one of the first, um, uh, he's very well known and uh, was one of the first in a role like that. So anyway, that's, that's what I, that's some of the things I know. <laughs> Well, Probably thank you. I know as much or more. I'm sure you know more than I do. Well, I don't know. I know <laughs> quite a bit. And, and thank you because uh, it helped you out your decision, obviously. So <laughs> you got it right. Okay. <laughs> We've got a couple more we'd like to do. Still got some time. Liz is going to try to launch that next question. Uh, it's up. Oh, okay. I can't see if it's up or not. So. Okay, well, I'll read it to you. Everybody <laughs> okay. can see it. You're a black woman living in normal in 1938. A friend asked you to go to the movie with her. You know that blacks can only sit in the balcony. So what do you do? You accept the invitation and sit in the black section, which would have been the balcony. Refuse to go where you can't sit wherever you want or go, but complain to the usher and ask you to sit in certain seats. Complain to the usher when he asks you to sit in certain seats, A, B, or C. So think about that one. I'll end here. I'll end the poll here in just a few seconds if everybody wants to. I think we have 22 people out of the 31 here that have voted in this poll. So put your last minute votes in and I'll close it up. Okay. Okay, accept the invitation to sit in the black section. Look like it's accept the invitation. Look like um, is the leader on that with 52%. And uh, okay, some would go but complain. Okay. Jeff, that's a that's a hard one because, uh, like was mentioned earlier, with what we know now, I would want to complain. But knowing my personality, I would be much too scared to complain, and I would just go so I could experience the movie and talk about it with my friend later. Um, but definitely, just do what I was told to do, essentially. Um, so that's a really hard one, knowing what we know now. Yeah. I, I think the other piece of it is that you know. You can get thrown out, you can get arrested, you know, because that was the law of the land, you know what I mean? And, um, right. you know, unless there's an uprise, then at that time, you have to go along with what's going on. And that's unfortunate, but, uh, but then you got a friend that understands it, obviously, and invites me, uh, invites us, and... Um, Either you go miss out, you know, you go you go take a stance by saying I'm not, or you know if you if you are in disagreement of it and you go into the usher, that might not be a good move. <laughs> <laughs> right. He's yeah, just doing his job. Exactly. He's doing his job. He understands the makeup. So anyway, I, that's, no, that's absolutely right. Um, 
We went with the uh, accepted invitation, but the answer uh, was refuse to go where you can't sit where you want. And uh, I'm gonna share a little bit about that in a little bit when we, when we get done with the last one. So everybody got that? We do have a question in the chat from Warren. He asked, what year did Rosa Parks refuse the back of the bus? That is a good question indeed. And uh, was it 64? I think it was. No, it was 1964. It was their second time of doing that. And yeah, she, she was the second one. woman that did that. <laughs> right. But they picked her because they wanted to get it to the Supreme Court. And they knew she had the stamina to do that. And then she didn't have any baggage, as, as people say. But there were there were Yeah, there, she was she was definitely someone you couldn't argue character wise. Right. And uh, they had known her for, she had been involved, of course, in the struggle for a long time. But I, I, yeah, I always found that interesting that when we talk about black history and civil rights, we want to reduce it to um, a, a single incident of Rosa refusing uh, to sit in the back of the bus. Because again, like you folks already know, there was, there was other um, actions as well um, that we don't talk about, so. Um. Uh, Gloria Gilmore, she opened up her uh, house for uh, Blacks uh, during the, um, the boycott from Montgomery and um, upon uh, Dr. King's suggestion. And uh, when Kennedy came into town, uh, he asked for her food to be brought out to him to his plane. Um, so um, a lot of stuff, you know, people that don't get, you know, we don't hear about. But that, that's the fun of history, though, right? Okay, um, we can do another one here. We got time for one more. We'll do the last one. I found this to be interesting because my parents are from Mississippi. You are a black mother living in Tupelo, Mississippi. Your son and daughter come home carrying the lunch you sent to bring to the father. They tell you that a white boy urinated on his lunch. Yeah. So what would you do? Tell them it's not their fault and make extra food for your husband's lunch. Go to the boy's house and yell at the parents. Or three, find the boy and punish him for his actions. Let's see what everybody thinks there. And this activity was, you know, of course, is designed to just really uh, get people to thinking about it and sparking com conversation uh, as to where we were and where we are now and, and what would you do? Uh, Jeff, no uh, year or era uh, assigned with this uh, scenario? Uh, with this scenario, let me look really quick. I don't think there is, uh, or maybe I just, uh, uh, I do not, I do not, but um, I'm gonna guess that this was um, early 1900s, I'm just guessing. I'm sorry, I don't have a date for that one. Good question. Hey, Jeff, it's Chris. Um, Chris. These are hard to answer because I know what I would do now being older and, you know, just more strident, I guess, in, in my, my reactions. But back then, that's, that's a tough one. I, I wimped out on this answer. You'll see so, it. So tell us what you would do today. <laughs> well, I don't know about finding the boy, but I'd talk to the parents and like, what? What is this? It'd be a big battle, I'm sure. It'd be hard for me because I'm a Libra and I like evenness. I don't like 
dissension, but yeah, yeah. So I, I, I would hopefully go after the parents and talk to them about it. Okay, you guys are doing a good job of handling these polls because the answers are coming up quick. Looks like uh, ninety six percent. Um, voted to tell them that it's not their fault and make extra food for your husband's lunch. Sound like the safe thing to do, right? I think, uh, Linda, you alluded to that as well. And you too, Chris, I, I get that. Um, and um, the answer is find the boy and punish him for his actions. No, no, I disagree, I disagree. <laughs> Well, I'm glad you I'm glad you spoke out on that. This is why we have this. I disagree. And, and, and I think this is what makes it fun. Because I purposely, or maybe not purposely, didn't give you the full context of all of the answers. I just gave you the general answers because I'm going to share them all with you now to kind of so maybe you can get this to soak in, right? Did they say um, the the um the first question dealt with the uh the black coach. The board of ISNU appointed George Green, a black barber, to bring experience and discipline to the baseball team. ISU didn't hire another black coach for another 75 years. Okay. Um, the scenario with the black movie goers. Black movie goers were segregated to the balcony until the late 1950s. Some people, as you learned earlier, like Alice Covington, the wife of a prominent black doctor, refused to go to the movies for that reason. And the last one that we disagreed on, some of us, well, some of us disagreed on the scenario. After a white boy urinated on the lunch she made for her husband, a black woman in Mississippi slapped the boy. The white boy's parents threatened the black family with violence even though their son had urinated on a lunch that the black woman made for her husband. The black family left for Bloomington that night. They were in the South. So there you go, um, Linda. Yeah, you disagreed. If you wanted to stay where you were at, I guess that's what you had to do, right? Um, yeah, they had to leave town. And that's how we know that story because that family ended up in Bloomington. Yeah, I mean, that wouldn't even be something I would do today. You know, go and find a kid and punch him and go and yell at him. I mean, that's not the way to accomplish. It's against the uh, law. What you're trying to do, right. you know, so. Yeah. Yeah. Tempers flare. Yeah. Um, people I, do different things. Questions? I have to make, I want to make a comment. Sure. Now, we may know of and may have suffered, and then I'm, I'm not saying suffer is a bad word, but have had a good old butt whooping <laughs> growing up. And that was you know, because you disrespected, you know, somebody else. I remember getting a butt whooping for doing something in somebody else's yard by Mrs. Rice. I did, I, I had scratched her car with my bike. I got a whooping from her. And then when I got home, I got another one from my own parents. <laughs> now this was just in the seventies, but however, back then, you know, punishment, it was more prevalent about, you know, hey, you don't disrespect other people's property. You do not do that to one another. And it was a community thing. And nowadays, here nowadays, you speak of spanking of anybody, spanking a child of your own, you're scared to do that. And the child, you know, if we're going to go back to the biblical terms, it says spare not a rod. And here we are. We're dealing with a lot of different types of um, issues when it comes to mental issues and, and other things of that sort, but that's not the reason or the case for all. But 
when you disrespected someone, you, I could see how in Tupelo, because my family on my father's side was from Gunnison, Mississippi, which was right not, was not far from the, uh, the Mississippi River. So I remember my grandmother telling me about issues, you know, or it didn't matter what color you were. And because most of the time she helped to raise those kids. Um, and if someone did that to her husband's lunch, she probably would have went back and got Jimmy and, you know, cause my dad's name was James and back then it was Jimmy and would have, you know, say, Hey, here's another lunch. Go take, take that back there. Give, give it to your dad. And she probably would have went to that young man and spanked him and then took him to his parents and, and it would have been reconciled. However, today it is completely flipped. Nobody even touched their own kids. How do you guys feel about that? I'm with you. I, I obviously grew up with a, a similar family and uh, similar traditions. And yeah, if you want, if you want to get in trouble, double trouble, <laughs> that's what you did because uh, you, you get it in the streets and um, you would hear it from the parents. And then when you got home, you'd be in trouble as well. Um, but yeah. Uh, I will say I'm definitely, I'm not young in any sense, but I'm, young, I'm a younger generation and I definitely got spankings from my parents. Chris, I'm sure you don't believe that at all. She knows my parents. Um, <laughs> but like another another family wouldn't punish me but i think in that situation in mississippi it probably depended on that specific family and who it was and since that family did threaten violence they would leave but maybe if you had a different relationship with another family white or black in in that area then you would have felt comfortable going and punishing that kid i think a lot of it even nowadays is still just dependent on who it is and what exactly happened and the type of punishment. But I know definitely now, uh, being in education, um, spankings and you know punishment in any form is a is a big conversation uh, that we have often, and it, the ideology behind it has changed a lot. Thanks for sharing that. Uh, this is Beverly Gay, and I grew up in the uh, 50s and 60s in Chicago, and in the Black community, that was the norm. I got a spanking on a regular basis, and I thank God for it today. I think it helped me become the woman that I am, um, and not only did my parents, well, I should say my mother, my father never spanked me, but not only did my mother spank me, but the neighbors, if they saw me doing something I wasn't supposed to do, my extended family, and that, like I said, that was just the norm. Every, you know, it didn't seem out of order or uh, strange to anyone. That's what we did in our community. And um, how I feel about it now, I'm, I'm not real sure because now we have a whole different set of values and laws and things like that. And I do know people today who still, you know, spank their children, uh, maybe not as often or whatever. It didn't physically harm us. It wasn't violent. They weren't, you know, we didn't ha have marks left or anything, but we knew that when our parents told us something and we didn't do it, we knew that those were going to be the consequences. And like I said earlier, I, I, I really believe that I am better for it. And I don't feel bad about the things that happened to me as a result of it. I, I have to throw into, I grew up around the Chicago area in a mixed neighborhood. It didn't matter what color you were. It didn't matter whether you were Italian or Catholic or whether you were, you know, it just didn't matter. When we stepped out and played in the neighborhood, Everybody was our mom. And if you did something this despicable, everybody came down on you. It, it was just, it was just common 
discipline for common sins. Uh, <laughs> there was just some things that weren't accepted. It, 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 it didn't have to do with anything other than that's just not acceptable. You just don't do that. And it was a very disrespectful thing to do. Plus, it was, it was a nauseating thing to do. It was an atrocious thing to do. And what was your point? And so the whole neighborhood would have been on this kid quite, quite quickly. I never got spanked when we were growing up, but I did get my mouth washed out with soap a couple of times because I had a smart mouth. That wasn't fun, but it was effective. I did too, Chris. I went to a Catholic school and that was the punishment of choice for the nun. <laughs> Ivory soap. I remember it well. <laughs> can, I, can I just say that, um, and it's, this is a, a preference, it's, it's about your environment, it's, it's about how you brought up, it's about your culture, it's about a lot of things. So one, one thing doesn't always work for everybody. Uh, but I will say this, that um, being a, 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 a black person, uh, colored, African-American, black. Um, I grew up during a time of, and I know uh, that uh, Beverly Gay is telling her age, I'm not telling my age, that, that during a time of my growing up, um, the idea was that, you know, your, your parents are trying to discipline you in-house so the police don't discipline and kill you outside the house. And because we knew that some of the behaviors could draw attention to, to law enforcement that would cause you to be in arm's way. And so the parents was trying to instill and trying to raise you in a way to, you know, respect authority, uh, but also be able to uh, not find yourself whereas what I call not as bad, what parents call not as bad inside the house, but outside, you got to have that talking with them as we have to have today. It's that talk so that when you leave here, you come back. So when you say don't do, and they go out in the street and somehow uh, they don't know the difference uh, because you haven't really, you know, put that mm on don't do that. You know, they out there thinking they just like everybody else. And, you know, as we know today, that's not true. And so the black parents have got to have that conversation, especially with black boys, that you got to be careful on what you say and what you do and who you say it to. Uh, we can fight, and I, I, I tell my boys, we can fight this through, verbally, pen and paper, you know. Uh, that's how we, we, we want to magnify the situation with, with our voices raised high. But I don't want, and, and, I, and I don't want my son's hands raised high. I don't want them to even get used to that. I'm telling my I'm telling my grandson that I never want you in a position. But just because what I don't want doesn't necessarily mean that's what's going to happen. But I want him to know that there are things that are better for him and that there are people within our surroundings that believe the same thing too. Uh, and so it, it is imperative that we we understand who's saying what. Who's saying what? What voices are we hearing and where the voices experiences are? You know, black people don't want and ain't trying to kill their kids. Let me just say that. Black parents want their kids to be able to walk the streets go to school and be able to be who they want to be. 
without feeling like they inferior and that they look i ain't trying to go down this way i'm just trying to make the point that it it, it varies we cannot put everybody in this box because every black person ain't the same let me tell you that <laughs> you know and so what we got to do is look at it from a standpoint of how do we make each other better how do i make my grandson grow up to be a productive loving citizen how do i how do i do that because i know you want that for yours too so if we all want that then we take all of that noise out the way oh take the distraction out the way of color take that distraction out away from from economics take all that distraction out and we still want the same thing for our kids. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for sharing. And I think in that sense, that also speaks to the idea that we really are more alike than we are different because we want some of the same things. Do you mind if I just answer a question real quick? I just want you guys to know that not like I agree with uh, with uh, what's going on. Not every parent parents the same way, regardless of race, regardless of what type of information that we have out there. I raised two young men, black men, um, and they're they're uh, wonderful young men who have moved the group and never had an issue in the streets and the whole night so I totally get it it is a crucial conversation that we do have to have and it's a wonderful thing it's a wonderful tool to use so I want you guys to understand that it's not just spanking and not talking about it or, or, or even spanking at all sometimes it was just a talk sometimes it was you know take away the game controller sometimes it was you know hey if you want to act grown, let's talk about how to be grown. It, it was those, those crucial conversations. And we have to really, truly understand. And I'm not going to hold much time because I know we need to be off of here. Um, crucial conversations with our young Black men, young Black women, uh, people of color. We all have the same type of upbringing. In a, in a, we're more alike than we are different, to be quite honest. And when we truly have... Um, um, different types of races as are um, who we can truly call as friend, um, you'll see that there is more commonality and common ground than there is a difference. And um, the difference here lately has been that our young Black men have been more targeted. And that is an issue that we have. And that is something that we as a community must stand together and try to eliminate those things that are that are wrong and we know that they're wrong and we're being silent and we can't be silent anymore we have to stand together we have to really put our word and our voices together to stand for what's right not just here in bloomington no this is in the united states of america thank you thank you so much jeff what i appreciate your time the presentation you. forward to tomorrow. I Thank do. every one of you. I mean, I, I, I'm learning from this as well. That, that's what we want it to be. We want it to be a, a conversation. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Then and now, what would you do? Yeah. Yep. What would you do? <laughs> well, again, I'll echo uh, Tiffany's. T Jeff, thank you so much. Thank you so much to everybody who participated in the conversation. It was a great conversation. And I really look forward to tomorrow and hopefully we'll see you all then. Um, if anybody missed this session and they want to catch up with it, any of your friends, I will have it posted on our website sometime by the end of this week. So uh, that'll go with all three sessions as well. So Thank you so much, and we'll see you all tomorrow. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Great forum.